Well, all right, everybody. Welcome back to week number two of our study of the Holy Spirit. Hello to all of you who are joining us online. Come on, give your church family a great hand. All of you watching by the thousands all over America, I want to say a big shout out to all of you at Camp Pendleton. There's a bunch of Marines, everybody, that join us every week from California. And uh, Levi and all you guys, I love you. I'm so glad you're a part of our church. Welcome, glad you're here. We are going to jump into that in just a minute, but we are in the 21 days of prayer, 6 a.m. every morning, 9 o'clock on Saturday. Today's also day eight. Hasn't it been an amazing week already? We have just wanted to get close to God. That's the whole goal, and to pray for each other. It's been a refreshing time for my soul. I invite you to join me tomorrow morning. I'll be speaking uh, at 6 a.m. if you want to hear more, but I hope you come back. Uh, also, at the end of the 21 days, we have that big celebration you heard about on the news, and we're just going to have the biggest party ever uh, in Sunday afternoon on the 22nd day, where we just say, we love you, we missed you, let's get back together. So all of you people that are online that haven't made it back yet, we hope we'll see you out and we'll have a great time hanging out, eating some good food, and enjoying a great parking lot concert. All right, I want to talk to you again about the Holy Spirit because I think just talked about either so little or it's talked about in such a weird way that people um, have missed out on one of the greatest things that, that's in the Bible. In fact, my theme verse for this series is uh, 20 years after Jesus died, rose again, the Apostle Paul finds some believers in a city called Ephesus, and there he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No. We have not even heard there's a Holy Spirit. And I think that's really the case today for a lot of people that never heard any good teaching. They'd honestly say, I don't, I don't really know a lot about it. Or um, what they saw was so weird. Uh, and really, by the people who claim to have a corner on the Holy Spirit, their lives were so inconsistent that people said, well, I don't want anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And so um, I want to take what's maybe been either abused or neglected or stereotyped or even made very confusing and make it incredibly clear and just do a Bible study with you, teach you God's word. And so when we talk about confusing, people don't even understand the idea of, of the Trinity, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And some of you might say, well, Trinity is not in the Bible, you know, or maybe someone from another religion can't understand. You guys have, you Christians have three gods. No, it, we, we believe in one God who has revealed himself in three ways because he has three distinct functions. And it is a mystery, but it's certainly not confusing because it says in the Bible, therefore go and make disciples. These are the words of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God revealed in three persons. And you say, well, I still don't understand that. It's three, it's, what do you all worship in three gods? And, it's, and, and you say something like in your mind, you're confused because it's like, look, 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 one plus one plus one is three. So I don't understand. It doesn't have to be confusing. There is a mystery to this, but it doesn't have to be confusing. Our God is a God of order and he reveals himself. And if you just study and look, there's a mysterious part of how We'll never get our minds completely around it, but mystery is different than confusing because I can tell you, yeah, one plus, this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches one plus one, one times one times one is one. It's God. I mean, it makes perfect sense. So it's, there's a mystery, but it's, it's confusing for many people. So I want to take something that's a confusing subject and introduce you again to the, the third person of the Godhead, theologically, uh, God the Holy Spirit. Some of you know all about God. You identify with Jesus and the fact that he saved you, but you know nothing about God the Holy Spirit, and that's our plan today. I think you're going to love this message today. If you're kind of a Bible geek and you geek out on Bible facts, you're going to love this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you up a good one today. You ready for it? Pull out your notes. All of you online, download the notes. Let's pray. Now, Father, we know your love. Jesus, we're grateful for your grace. Holy Spirit, come do a work in our lives. We hold nothing back, and we're listening for your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. After Jesus' suffering on the cross when he died and he rose again, he presented himself and gave many convincing proofs to his disciples that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. After that Passover where he was crucified, 
uh, he appeared, he rose from the dead, and he appeared to them over this period of 40 days, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, not that he was a ghost or some, you know, um, apparition of Jesus appeared, the real Jesus in bodily form. He rose from the dead, and he was eating with them, and he gave them this command. He said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. The night before he was crucified, he spent... Uh, an, uh, the whole night teaching them about the Holy Spirit, that he would not leave them alone as orphans, but that he would give them his spirit. In fact, what's incredible, he's reminding them, he says, John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so the writer of the book of Acts, his name is Luke. He's one of the disciples uh, that, that followed Jesus a little bit later, and he's leaving this record that, that Jesus appeared after his resurrection, and he told his disciples, don't do anything. After, 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 uh, after he's been risen from the dead, Jesus said, wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me talk about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days will you be baptized from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now this, this idea of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, this appears in all four of the Gospels. And that's important because the Gospels are written by four different people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they wrote from their own experience. And so the first three books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are written, they're called the Synoptic Gospels. They, they tend to focus primarily on the last year of Jesus' life leading up to the crucifixion. John's Gospel was written a little bit later, and he focuses on the first two years of Jesus' life. And so because of their disparate perspectives, as they talk about Jesus to give us a full picture of who he is, there's very few things that show up in all four of the Gospels. In fact, there's only five that show up in all four, which means they're very important. So all four of the Gospels talk about the birth of Jesus. All four Gospels talk about the death of Jesus. All four Gospels talk about the resurrection of Jesus. All four Gospels teach the story of Jesus and the miracle of feeding the 5,000, which was an important miracle because that essentially says, when Jesus is with you, you have everything that you need. It's the beginning of his prayer. Like, if you have him, he can multiply whatever you need. That's in all four. But the fifth thing, that's, and the only, the only thing that's, that, again, is in all four Gospels is this statement, that there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's shocking that so many people have been in church all of their lives and they hear nothing about this when it's taught in all four of the Gospels. So, so Luke is writing in Acts, he says, Jesus said, in a few days you'll be baptized by the Spirit. He says in the book of Luke, he says, this is, he's recording Jesus' words, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. Here it is again. But stay in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, notice, with power from heaven. And so he said, wait. And what happened was they did. They didn't understand what the gift was. They were trying to wrap their heads around it. But in humility and submission to the idea, if Jesus promised something, then I don't know what it is, but we're going to wait and see what he promised. And they met in the temple every day. And then they gathered in this upper room. And on the 10th day after Jesus left, he'd appeared to them for 40. And on the 10th day after he left, the Holy Spirit showed up. And he baptized them in an incredible way. So 40 days that he appeared to them, and they waited for 10. In fact, the very day that Jesus uh, sent the Holy Spirit was something called the Day of Pentecost. And what Pentecost means, it means the 50th day after Passover, the 50th day. It, exactly on the 50th day after the Passover, Jesus was crucified and killed on the Passover, and he rose again, and he appeared to them for 40 days, waited for 10 days. The 50th day is Pentecost. It's really important because for some of you, you think Pentecost, uh, it means weird. Well, listen, God's not weird. People are weird, but God's not weird. You know that Pentecost means penti, which means five, and costi to the tenth. It means fiftieth. Y'all thought that was weird. It's, it's a crazy and sad to me how something so simple has been made to be so weird. So this is important. I, I want to come back and talk to you today. A little, I want to fill in the details. Passover and Pentecost. I want to show you these two important days and what the significance of these days. Jesus was crucified 
on Passover. What's Passover? Well, you remember the story, don't you? Don't you remember the movie? Didn't you see Charlton Heston? Didn't you see how, how he said to Moses, or Moses said to the people, let my people go uh, to, to Pharaoh? And they were enslaved, the children of Israel crying out, and all these great miracles happened. The last one was that, that uh, if you don't let us go, God's going to, to kill the firstborn. And so what they did, remember, they got inside the house and they killed a lamb and they, they the, put the blood over the doorpost. And anyone who was under the blood inside that house, the death angel passed over, Passover. And then that, that, um, the result of that great miracle was the Egyptian says, go, be gone. I mean, they were in such grief. They, they, they had lost their firstborn children. And Pharaoh said, go. And that night, God saved his people from Egypt. And so, the, so the, the, the Bible goes on to say, don't ever forget this. Wherever you live in the world, every year you stop and you remember and you never forget this night that God saved you out of Egypt. And so if you, if you look this up, in fact, if you just go to jewishencyclopedia.com, you'll find out some details that the Passover lamb was, in Numbers 9 says, to be uh, sacrificed at twilight. Specifically, if you want to know Jewish... Encyclopedia.com says the Passover lamb was killed at 3 p.m. in the afternoon so they could take care of it. Actually, it was hung up and stretched out, and they were careful not to break any of its bones. And then they would cut the abdomen, and the blood would spill out. They'd catch that, and that's how they applied the blood. Very, very significant. And that had to all be done before Sabbath, before the sundown, because no work could happen then. Now, that sacrifice was important because that sacrifice, the blood over the doorpost, it actually served as a covering for their sins. And this had to go on all the time, of course, because the people had, had, had to have their sins covered. The, the blood of a sacrifice had to, be, had to be made to cover sins. Now watch this. On the Passover that Jesus was crucified, look how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament picture. Because when Jesus uh, was crucified on the cross, Mark's gospel says that he was put on the cross from the, from the, ninth, from the, from the third hour to the ninth hour. So... From, from 9 in the morning till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Google the crucifixion of Jesus. It will tell you that Jesus was crucified at 3 He died at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And so he was hung up there, right? Do you remember he was stretched out and that not one of his bones were broken and that they pierced his side and blood came out? And what happened that was so different this time was that his sacrifice didn't just cover our sins. His sacrifice actually removed our sins once and for all. The miracle of Passover. The fulfillment of Passover, in fact, the Apostle Paul writes, when he gets this, he says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So that's the miracle. When, when Jesus died on the cross, all of your sins were removed. If you believe this, your sins are removed from your life, that, that you need nothing more than the cross to secure your eternity forever. It doesn't have to be mixed with anything else, no works, no, just the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus, and your eternity is secure. But yet, but yet, but yet, but yet, Jesus told his disciples, I'm alive, I've done what, I've fulfilled Passover, but now you need to wait in Jerusalem for the gift that my Holy Spirit will send you. And why there's a, why there's a Pentecost in the first place is because when they left Egypt after that first Passover, they ate that food, they were packed, they were dressed, they were ready to go. You remember the movie? And they all marched out that night into the desert. They came to the, to the Red Sea and it parted and they came through. And then they, they keep marching out in the wilderness and they went for, guess how long? 50 days. On the 50th day, they arrive at Sinai. When they get to Sinai, Moses goes up onto the mountain and there he he, 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 he has a dramatic encounter with God. Do you remember what happened that first Pentecost, the 50th? It's not a weird word. Don't be afraid of Pentecost. It's the 50th day after Passover. The cloud descends with a loud noise with wind and fire on that mountain. There was an earthquake and the lightning fell. And watch this. The, 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 God wrote his law on the tablets of stone. Do you remember from the movie? <laughs> and the lightning came and like carved out the, the words and it was dramatic and it was a big deal, and, and the, the Lord wrote, God, God wrote his law on tablets of stone, and so that was the day the nation of Israel actually began because the people were led out of slavery, and God gave them his code. They gave them his laws and said, this is the way, and this is what you'll do, and actually, the law would go on to say, uh, he spoke to Moses, uh, do this, don't do this, and here are the consequences if you don't obey, and Moses, remember, he comes down off the mountain, 
And on that first day he comes off the mountain, he's not, the stones aren't, are still smoking, right? They, they're, the law is so fresh, but the, but the laws are already broken before the first day is gone. And he comes down and he finds the people in open rebellion to God, and it's the sound of war in the camp, and there's a conflict and even a little mini civil war. And what you read, that find out that 3,000 people died that day. So it was day of mourning, but a day of receipt. It's the day, and so all through history, Jewish people will celebrate Passover, and they will celebrate Pentecost, the day that we became a people, and the day we received God's law. Are you following me so far? Watch what happened on the Pentecost, the 50th day, after Jesus died and rose again, and he sent his Holy Spirit. Check this out. The Holy Spirit descended on those people with a loud noise with wind and with fire. Hmm. And then what happened was the Spirit came to dwell on the inside. In fact, the Scripture would say later that God's law was now written on their hearts. No longer tablets of stone, no longer rules that we have to try to obey, but God put us His Spirit to tell us what to do and to, from the inside, a new autopilot to tell us right from wrong. We'll talk about that later in a moment. He wrote His law on their hearts, and that day God established the church this was the day that the church began, and, and from that day forward, the church would be sent out, and the church was birthed all over the world, and here's what happened. On that very day, Peter got up, and filled now with the Spirit's power, he told all those people, this Jesus that you crucified, he's alive, and filled with the Spirit's power, watch this, 3,000 people got saved and believed God that day. I'm telling you, all the great stuff is in the details, everybody. It's incredible. Passover accomplish something, the forgiveness of your sins for all eternity, but there is always a Pentecost that follows Passover, and you don't need to be afraid of it. Jesus said, wait, because you need to receive power. You've got your heaven secure, but you're going to need some power for earth, power from heaven to come to you on your earth. Let me tell you about it. On that day of Pentecost, when it came, they were together in one place. They'd actually been together every day since Jesus ascended. They were meeting daily in the temple, worshiping, praying, seeking God. God, we're waiting for your promise. We don't know what you're going to do. We don't understand it. We don't know. They had no Bible. They just had the words of Jesus. And they were humble enough and submitted enough to say, if Jesus said that there's something for us to receive, well, we'll just wait. And so they did. And they waited. Suddenly there was a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, and it came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be, look at the glory, look at the fire coming down again, but this time not just on one person, not just on Moses, not just one man on the mountain. Now that, 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 that fire spreads. The glory of God comes to rest on every, does it say everyone? It's on each of them that were there, all of them. And watch this, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, not as they wanted, not as they, not as they you know, came up with it, as the Spirit enabled them. There was the, the power of God gave them some supernatural ability to do something, and this was important. Because it's Pentecost, because it's the 50th day after Passover, Jews from all over the world knew we have to celebrate in Jerusalem. We, so they, they would make the journey to come back for that period of time. Maybe we can celebrate the Passover and Pentecost in Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be amazing? So they were, they were the faithful from all over the world were there. And on that day in Jerusalem, right, where they were staying, there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, like, what is going on? And here's the, here's the bewilderment. Each one heard their own language being spoken. It was a miracle of supernatural clarity, of supernatural, there was a supernatural something in common, and they could all hear, no matter where they were from, no matter what region, no matter what their ethnicity was, their, their, their culture, no matter what language they spoke or their history, suddenly they could all hear the same thing. Isn't that incredible? So they were utterly amazed because, wait, 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 this doesn't add up. These, aren't these Galileans? Like, there's no way that those people could be doing this. It's like, it's like you guys thinking there's no way people from, and I'm going to stop right there because I'm a good pastor. I'm not going to fall into your stereotype, but you have a stereotype. You know exactly a group of people that you say, those people from, you know, from there. So all of you have that little stereotype, and those people did, and they were like, there's no way because these Galileans are uneducated. They're, 
They're, they're from the boondocks. They're from, they're from, they're from and I'm, I'm not going to say, but you're, you're thinking, you're thinking there's no way people from there could be, could be educated or be equipped enough to speak the wonders of God in our own language. And so they were amazed. They were bewildered. What is going on? And then here's the, here's the beautiful part. And this is one of those verses when you're reading your Bible, you all skip it and you go boring part and you skip and you just jump because it starts listing all the regions and the names and you just go, eh, I don't want to know about the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites and the Termites and all these other people. I don't, I don't care. But can I slow you just down and read the details? <laughs> of the Bible, because there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phygra and Pamphylia and Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs, and you're all going, so what's the big deal? I need to lift you up and give you the God point of view on all of this and show you that these people from everywhere were hearing the wonders of God in their own tongues. So here's the top God view looking down. It was a 360 representation, meaning like everybody in the whole world was there. Don't get caught up in the termites. Just It's not about, the, it's not about that. It's about the fact that God was make the, they were making a point that the whole world was represented, like everyone was here, all nations, all people, all tongues, all, all backgrounds, all races, they're all here, and every last one of them somehow was hearing the Spirit speak through these people in their own languages. This is a preview of the miracle that God wants to do today, that, that, they were, that, that God was somehow creating this miracle of hearing and that they could all understand this mutual understanding, this coming together. And so watch this, they were amazed and they were perplexed, they didn't understand it. I want you to know that that's a part of your spiritual journey that at times when God does things you will, should be, you should be rightfully amazed and perplexed, like I don't understand. And they asked this question, what does this mean? I wanna propose to you that's the question that you should be asking today. Well, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? And some people back then, they, they, they weren't asking what does this mean. They were crossing their arms and they were like, this is ridiculous. And they were mocking it and they actually made fun of them and said, they're like drunk. They're crazy. They're crazy people. They're drunk. And what I'd like you to what I suggest is that that same behavior is occurring even in our lives, in our lifetime. That people don't understand something and so, well, that's, listen, people are weird, but God is not weird. And I think we should be asking this question. And that's what I propose to you today is to, is to ask the question, what does this all mean? And Peter stood up. When they asked the question, Peter responds. He stands up now filled with the Spirit's power and he preaches a sermon that is so powerful that leads to 3,000 people believing in Jesus Christ that day and they were baptized. Think about how powerful that was. People who came just to worship the Lord, they, they showed up dry and they had no idea they would go home wet. I mean, God changed their day. They believed and were baptized that day. I want to read, I want to teach you, I want to expose, I want to unveil Peter's sermon and just really preach you the sermon on, that he said that day. When, when they ask, what does this mean? What is this thing that has happened? And Peter preaches a sermon on the power that came from heaven. And he tries to explain what, the, what has happened to them. And he, and he lists four things that happen that are, that are things that God does through his power. And he explains to them, like, the prophets who came before, they could only dream of a day like this day. I want to walk you through those things that he said. So are you ready? Let me write these down. The first one, the power of the Holy Spirit, it is the power to make us one. Oh, this is the best part right here. I love it that it's first, that it's the power to unite us and to make us one. Peter got up and said that the, the, the prophets could only dream of a day when everybody would be included and nobody would be rejected. No matter what your background was, what your ethnicity was, what your, whether you were on the outside before, you're on the inside now, everybody can be included. And the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them and suddenly they could, there was this miracle of common understanding. And watch what, what Peter says. He says, those, this, is, this is nothing less what's happening now. It's what a prophet years ago promised would happen when God said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on 
all people, on all people, not just Moses on the mountain, one guy, not just one of the priests. And really, this was a reference, this pouring was a reference to how the Spirit of God in the symbol of oil being poured over the head of a priest when he was anointed for ministry. This pouring, this idea of like a liquid coming over them and they, and they were set apart and, and made holy for the use of God. This is, this is a, a breaking of that. This is, this is now the Holy Spirit coming. Peter's saying this is now the day when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. Everyone is going to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And, did, and it's for all people. And this is so powerful. This is the idea. This, this, this means that Pentecost is the answer to, to division, to, to barriers. Uh, it is the, it's the breaking down of barriers and the beginning of the vision of heaven on earth. That's what this is about. Do you remember the story? Maybe some of you don't, but in Genesis chapter 11, there's a story where the opposite of this happened. On that day, there were a group of people who came together and in their minds, they were in direct rebellion to God. They were, they were filled with pride and a sense of rebellion. And their attitude was, we can do whatever we want to do. And so what God did on that day, he did a miracle of confusion where suddenly they could no longer understand each other and disunity broke out and conflict happened and they were scattered. No wonder they called that place Babel because suddenly no one could understand. And so what Pentecost is, it's a reversal of the curse of Babel. That day when the nations, basically, when people were divided and separated, and this is where we actually look back and say, this is where all the division occurred and began. Well, Pentecost is the, is, the, is the miraculous working of God. Do you know what oil is supposed to do? You know what oil does, everybody? It reduces friction. And when the Holy Spirit comes and pours himself out on his people, there's something that happens. There's something that, that the Holy Spirit does that cannot be explained, but it's the power to make us one. It's the power where we realize that the same Holy Spirit Spirit is in me that's on you, which means that if the Holy Spirit is in me and the Holy Spirit's in you, and I recognize that we may come from different ethnicities, but that means I have more in common with you than someone of my own ethnicity that doesn't get this. It's incredible. This is the power to make us one. What you are experiencing and what I dream for, what I pray for every day is, oh God, let the, let the miracle, the power of Pentecost come upon us, that in this day, we would have this supernatural fulfillment even of the prayer of Jesus, even of the prayer of the Apostle Paul who would say, that's right, there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there even male or female. See, the beginning of Pentecost, the Pentecost was the beginning of the breaking down of all barriers. The Holy Spirit was poured out on all. It is the end of cultural supremacy. It is the end of elitism. It is the end of racism. It is the end of gender barriers. It is the end of age classism. It's the end of economic uh, division, it is the bringing people together as one. And it was the, it is what Jesus was talking about that night. He was teaching them the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to enable you. He's going to help you to do things that you can't do. I won't leave you alone. I'll help you. And then he prayed after those John 13, 14, 15, 16, chapter 17, Jesus prays. I pray also for those who believe in me. Believe what? Believe in everything I've been teaching about the Holy Spirit. That through their message that all of them may be one. The power of the Holy Spirit, why, why, why? So that the world may believe that there is a God, that he sent them, and that maybe God loves them too. When they see the way that you love one another, they will know that there's a God who loves them too. We need that power today, and today we're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit among us. Thank God for the power to make us one. But there's more. It's the power, number two, to live victoriously. And this is so exciting because, because when the law was given on Sinai, it was an external law. It was written in stone and the people struggled. Even the first day, they couldn't obey it. And all through the history of the Bible, it's basically the laws of stone don't work. You can't obey. You can't keep up. And some of you have lived as a Christian frustrated because I'm just tired. It's like I keep trying, but I can't, I keep going back because there's a little part of me that still wants to do the wrong thing. And it's like I let go for a minute and psh, I'm back doing the wrong thing. And some of you are tired because the, you just can't, the, 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 this life was never meant to be lived by a list of rules like do this. And that's why any attempts by spiritual leaders to try to hold that up is absolutely the wrong way to go. Peter, Peter got up and he says, this Holy Spirit will be poured out on all. And then he says something amazing. He says, listen, what's going to happen is your sons and your daughters, they'll prophesy. 
Your young men will see visions. Your young men will dream, your old men will dream dreams. And what, don't get caught up in what's the difference between prophecy, visions, and dreams. What he's saying is, is that everybody, like old, young, men and women alike, all of you all be, will suddenly have the ability to know God, to hear God. God will speak. God will show you things that you, that you couldn't see before. You'll hear things that you didn't know before. It's like there's something on the inside of you that will be pointing you in the right way and say, this is the way. Walk in it. Like you'll know right from wrong, and you'll, you'll have the want to on the inside. He says, I will pour out to emphasize again on those days, men and women, like everybody will have this Holy Spirit available to them. That's why Jesus said, you guys got to wait, wait, wait. Let me pour something on you that makes this that, that makes it possible, not just to be saved for heaven, but to live victoriously on earth. Can I get a better amen, somebody? God wants to help you. He wants to give you the power that you don't have. You don't have it. I don't care if you wear the WWJD bracelet. It ain't going to work for you. Because I can't do what Jesus did in my own power. But with the spirit of Jesus living on the inside of me, giving me the heart, according to Galatians uh, 5, 17, where he says that the, that the Spirit gives us desires that are completely the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Paul would say in Romans, he would say, you are no longer controlled. When the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you're, you're no longer controlled by that old nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. Oh, we need, we need to be filled with the Spirit's power. And, and that's why today it's so important. Because listen, if all that we have is to tell people, this is what you're doing wrong, and you better do right, and if all, and this is what's so frustrating, is to watch people try to control people with external law. Do this, do that, and the world is going like, I'm not listening to you. And somebody's coming up and saying, well, what's your position on this, and what's your opinion on that? And you know what my answer is? <laughs> my opinion means nothing. But let me tell you something. God loves you. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. And bring me your sick people. I'll pray for them in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, pastor, that's you. No, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all. You will be my witnesses. What's a witness? You just tell what God has done for you. You don't have to, con it's the Holy Spirit's job to point out what's wrong in people's life. He will kick convict the world. So what you're called to do is to tell people that God loves them like he loves you. Look what he's done in my life. Now, do you have people who are sick? Do you have people who are addicted? Do you have people who are broken? Let me pray in the name of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. This leads me to my third point, which Paul said, not, or Peter said, not only the power to make us one, and not only the power to live victoriously, but you have the power to live supernaturally. There's power that's available to you. And I want to clear this up. I want to make this plain, that God never intended you to try to live the Christian life in your own understanding and in your own strength. It does not work. Do you think that God would have shown you Jesus and shown what his disciples and to give you that example and say, now walk in this way? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. You, have to, you can't do it in your own understanding. If you, if you serve God, he is going to blow your mind at times. He's going to do things that are bigger than you and beyond you. There's going to be things that are mystery. Thank God that we have a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm thankful that I serve a God who still does miracles. I'm glad that I can pray that God will still heal people and God will still deliver people and God will still raise people up from, from situations that are impossible. I'm so glad to tell you because some of you are facing impossible situations today. Some of you have impossible situations in front of you. How horrible would it be to serve a, a, a religion that had no power? And some of you think, well, that's not me. That's for those holy people. You sound like those people that were saying, well, those are just Galileans. How can they? Yeah, they can't do it. It's impossible. But when the Holy Spirit fills you, the, it's not you. I don't have no gift of healing, but the Holy Spirit can heal anybody that he wants. My job is to allow the Holy Spirit to work through my life and in my life and to have the faith to say, Lord, I'm going to pray for somebody and to ask God to get involved in their life. Watch what Peter said. He said in the sermon, he said, like, when, when, when God shows up, I will show up in wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. And then he says these blood, fire, billows of smoke. Do you know what he's referring to? He's referring back to Pentecost. That's what happened on Pentecost. The first one, on Sinai, when there was the earthquake and the lightning and the fire and then the conflict and all of that. And then, but he says, but I will show, I will show wonders. What's a wonder? Well, I wonder how that happened. 
I have no idea. I can't explain it. But God healed that marriage. God, she should be dead, but she's alive. God healed her. God turned that situation around. I have no explanation. There must be a God. When, when they see how you love one another and they experience the power of God, that's how, that's, that's how the world will be changed. And we can't do that in our own strength. That's why he said, disciples, disciples, don't try to run out there and just teach people the Bible and, and tell them what happened. You need to wait because your Passover experience has occurred. You've been saved. You've been forgiven. Your eternity is secure. But you need to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Am I making this clear, everybody? Am I teaching you the Bible today? I'm just trying to walk you through what the Scripture says. Watch this. Paul said, Paul said it this way. He says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. I want to stop there and say, do you think, if you think that I believe that what we're going to do is sing a few songs and I'll come out and say a few words and people's lives will be changed, I don't believe that at all. In fact, what I do believe is that we're a church that humbles ourselves before God and say, Lord, if you don't show up and use us together, if you don't send your Holy Spirit, if you don't touch the lives of people, if you don't come in your power and give people a real encounter with you, no lives will be changed. So God, we depend on you for everything. And we humble ourselves and we pray, and then God shows up. And he doesn't just use me. He's using people right now with your kids, and he's using people with your teenagers, and he's using people with different gifts and abilities, and somehow the Holy Spirit orchestrates the gifts of people with technical ability and worship ability, and people who have the gifts of outreach who've gone out all week long and touching the lives of people in a variety of ways, and somehow the body of Christ working together under the Holy Spirit's power and people wake up to God. I can't explain it. It's a mystery. It's not something we do. I got a letter from a man who said, I'm from a Muslim background. I'm from Turkey. Never been in a church like this before. And he said, last week when you said, raise your hand and I want to pray for you, he said, I felt something hit me physically. I just felt the, what you were describing, the presence of God. I, I knew that I needed to follow Jesus. I somehow just knew it, and I gave my life to Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's super natural. It's the power of God. And that's not just for me. It's, it's for anyone who would believe. Like, if you will have the faith to believe what the Word of God says, that the Spirit came upon who? Oh, yeah. All, oh, not just the disciples, because there were 120 there. So it wasn't just, and not just the men, right, right? Not just the men, right? Does it say that? On men and women, and not just the old people, but on the young people too? You've been sold a gospel that, that is missing the most incredible part. Yes, you're saved, you're going to heaven. But God has more for you to experience. And it's not weird. I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that what, what, if I was the devil, what I would do is I would try to make, I would try to use people to make something that was so powerful, so weird, so people would stay away from it. That's what I would do if I was the devil. But it's not weird. It's the power that you need. Jesus, when he was teaching about the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll ask the Father, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. We don't even have a word for it in English, the parakletos, this, this, one, this one word that, accompl- that, that, that gives you, uh, uh, he'll, be, he'll be in you, and he'll be with you, your comforter, your counselor, your helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, the one standing by to give you power in every situation to help you and to be with you forever, the one that's guiding you into what's true, and you don't have to have the word on the outside, it'll be in you. This is not weird. You need this. I will not leave you as, what, an orphan. What's an orphan? Weak, insecure, powerless, alienated, rejected. No, I won't leave you. I'll fill you with me, the spirit of me, and you will have power. And what's the power ultimately for? Number four, Peter says, the power is to fulfill the mission of Jesus. You wait into Jerusalem. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, then go. And then everywhere you go, tell people about me everywhere. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter gets up on that day, and he says all of these things, and then he calls out, he says, this Jesus that you all crucified, he is the Lord. He's the Son of God. He's risen from the dead. We've seen him with our own eyes, and we have been filled with his Spirit. The same Spirit that has filled us is now available to all of you. This is none other than what Joel prophesied about all those years ago. It's happening. The Spirit came on all of us. We're his witnesses. And the people, it says, 3,000 of them were cut to the heart. 
the Holy Spirit convicted them, and they, they cried out. They said, brothers, what must we do? We feel we need to respond, and 3,000 people responded when Peter said this. Listen, it's for everybody. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Like, there's, no, there's nobody, there's no sin that you've done. There's no, there's no uh, culture that's wrong. There's no one on the outside. Anybody who comes, anybody who responds. See, this is, again, here's, here's what... Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. 3,000 people, they felt it. Brother, I need to give my life. I can't explain it, but I'm ready. This is what the Holy Spirit was given for. Can I just wrap this whole sermon up in a sentence for you? I want you to write this down and remember this. It's in the Bible. Jesus, in all four gospels, Jesus will come and he will baptize his disciples with the Holy Spirit He wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Why? To empower you to become like him. The Holy Spirit was not given so that you would, <laughs> so that some people would act weird in church. The Holy Spirit was not given for ecstatic behavior in church. The Holy Spirit was not given for Holy Ghost goosebumps, for a holy high that you would feel. You know what the Holy Spirit was given for? That 3,000 people would be saved in one day. That's the sign of the Holy Spirit, that people, it, because of your presence, because of the presence of God, there's suddenly something. I need to know God too. I need to know the Lord. I need to find, I need to find, I need to have what you have. That's the sign. And God wants to make you like him. I can't be like him. Well, yeah, with God's Holy Spirit inside of you. It'll be like, you know, when you, when you're, when you, there was an autopilot that was set to do wrong. And every time you tried to do right, it took all this effort and all this energy. I, I'm trying to do the right thing. But the minute you let go, the wheel would go back to the autopilot. When the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, he gives you a new autopilot. Amen. So now, you know, you want to do it, and you're moving. And every once in a while, you grab the wheel, and you go do it the wrong thing, and you, and you, you make the decision, I'm going to do this, and you regret it, and go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you let go, and the wheel flies back, and now you're back on course again because the <laughs> autopilot is set in the right direction. Amen. So God wants to make you like him and then give you the supernatural ability to fulfill his mission. So they said, what should we do? How do we get this? How do we receive this? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Like, repent means change your mind about this. Like, turn from the way you used to think and think a new way. Be baptized. Be baptized. Just go public about this. Make the decision publicly in, in a symbol of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus that I'm going to be identified with him from this day forward. And that's what most people have done. They've, they've, they've done that first part. And they've identified with Jesus. They say, I believe. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because he forgave my sins and I'm going to heaven. And they stop and they put a period right there. But watch. And, does it say and? And, and, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you. Somebody taught this once that was like, well, that was just for those disciples back then. They were special. No. No. Because Peter's very clear. The disciples for you guys right here. It's for us and it's for you. It's for your children. Some of them might be here. Some of them might still be at home. And it's for all those who are far off. Like where all y'all came from and all these different countries, it's for them too. And then he goes on to say, for all. Does it say all? For all. That means for you. Has God called you? Has God, did God ever, God called me. I remember when I was a little kid, I, I grew up knowing about Jesus. I believed when I was at an early age. And then there came that point where I finally said, Lord, I surrender to you. And I had an encounter with the Spirit of God. It doesn't mean I was perfect. Lord knows my parents are here. I wasn't a perfect teenager after that. But the autopilot changed. And it led me today to standing before you right now, that decision. And I have just come to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll close with this illustration. When the Holy Spirit was given, it said that tongues of fire came and rested on all, on all of them. So it wasn't just Peter and the leader. It wasn't just the disciples that said it was on men and women. So if that, imagine if we were in that day right now. Let's imagine that we were there. You would look up and you would see this little symbol of the glory of God over my head. 
but you'd look over and you'd see your neighbor and there's the glory of God over their head too. And you'd look around and you'd say, oh my gosh, the glory of God is on, on her head and on the little kid. And oh my gosh, it's on this woman. And, it's, and you'd look around the room and you'd see the Holy Spirit on everybody, except you just couldn't see it on your head because it's over yours. And so you'd kind of look up and it would move because it's behind your head, you know, so you'd be... But the person sitting next to you would look at you and they would say, oh my gosh, the glory's on your head as well. And you couldn't see it on you, but by faith, right? Because the person told you, I see it on you too. By faith, you would have to believe that what's available for everybody else is also available for me too. By faith, I'm asking you to believe that very same thing today. You may not have ever been taught this before, you may never have seen it, but I'm saying you can receive all that the Holy Spirit has for you. God wants to put his glory on you. He wants to put his power in you. He wants to raise up a spirit of courage and strength. He is your advocate. He is your help. He's your comforter. He's your counselor. He's your guide. He is the standby. He is the one who will speak to you and tell you to pray things and stop and see need and meet needs. He is the spirit of all truth. And I'm praying that each one of you will receive the Holy Spirit. How do I do that? Well, wait for him. Do the same thing. Just wait. Do what those disciples, when they learned, they humbled themselves and they said, well, I'm just going to wait in the presence of God. They gathered in the temple. So what we do at the 21 days of prayer is to try to recreate a period of time where people can come every day and get close to God and seek God and wait for him. God, do a work inside of me. Cleanse my heart. God, I seek you. And God, please, I want to receive everything that you have for me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you pray that prayer, you're praying the prayer that Jesus wants you to pray. And he will fill you with his Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Do you receive this today? Oh, I hope that you do. Let's pray together right now. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our life. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the clarity of your word. When we just read it as it is, it's so, it's so plain. God, I pray that you would give us all what you've promised to us, all of it. We want it all. We, we don't hold back. We don't cross our arms. We, 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 we open our life to you and we receive everything. Teach us, Holy Spirit. For those of you who just feel it right now, you know you're far from God. There's something inside of you that's saying, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to be forgiven of sin. Maybe you knew him a long time ago, but you've went your own way. Maybe you've never even heard that there's a God who loved you, who gave his son to die on a cross for you, to forgive you of your sins. Today, you can make that decision to follow Jesus. You can believe today. I'm not gonna make this long, but if today you would say, I need Jesus in my life, I know I need his forgiveness. Right now, why don't you do it? Why don't you just slip your hand up with no one looking around. Just slip it up and put it back down so I can see it and pray for you. Yes, yes, yes. I got you. Yes, in the back. Yes, right here. Yes, yes, yes. Up in the risers, just lift it up and put it back down. Let me see you. Yeah, I got you right there. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes, right here. Say this prayer. If you're online, just raise your hand. God sees you. Pray this prayer with me. God, I know that I need you. I am so sorry for my sin against you. I need you, Jesus, to be my Lord and Savior. I believe somehow I know that you died for me. If you can't say it like that, just say, yes, God, that's me. I believe. Come live inside me. Come change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I receive you now. For every person praying this prayer, Lord, I pray you meet them in a powerful way. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, everybody. Give God thanks. Give God thanks.